For this conference will now be recorded. Stewardship and Plan Giving. And I'm Jim McDonald, Development Manager for Stewardship and Plan Giving. We're really happy to talk to you today about setting up legacy funds and endowments and developing a policy for your church or policies that will suit those funds. Just a note that this webinar is brought to you by the Presbyterian Church in Canada with support from gifts to Presbyterian sharing. So thank you for your continued support of our common mission and ministry together through Presbyterian sharing. A few technical things on how to participate. You'll notice, hopefully, if you're participating by computer, the screen where you can, it says chat, and you can type in your questions. We will try to answer them as we go along, and then we'll have uh, time for questions at the very end as well. The slides and the recording will be posted at presbyterian.ca backslash webinars backslash previous webinars if you want to find them afterwards. Feel free to share them with your session or committee members or anyone who you think might be interested. Okay, so we're going to be talking about endowment and legacy funds and possibilities for your congregation. Major gifts and legacy gifts can make all the difference to the future of any ministry or congregation. Endowment and legacy funds can bless your ministry by providing money to expand. With good design, they can enhance the mission and ministry of your congregation beyond annual gifts which are given through the offering plate. Some people in the past have been cautious about them undermining current gifts or propping up a congregation which is really no longer functional. And we'll try to talk about that during this webinar. We are hoping that this webinar will give you some ideas for how to set up endowment and legacy funds, promote them and use them to enhance the ministry of your congregation. So I thought that I'd begin by giving you a couple of stories of what a few congregations have done with endowment and legacy funds. The first story comes from Bethel, Nova Scotia. And some of you may have heard me tell it before because it's a great story. Well, Bethel was a congregation that had lots of kids, but very little money. They had a Christian education fund, endowment fund, that had about $5,000 in it. So if it was getting 5% interest, it was getting about $250 a year for Christian education. But they had a dream. They wanted to hire a part-time worker to work with the youth and to really engage children in their community. So they decided that one way they could help support this was by growing that endowment fund. They began by educating the congregation about planned gifts particularly about gifts of securities. They got kids involved in the campaign. And you know what it's like when kids are involved, it's lots of fun. They found that they were able to raise $100,000 in three months, 70,000 of which came from three gifts of stock. I'm sure when they began the campaign and were sitting around and planning it and they imagined the dreams, they had no idea that they would get these gifts. They just trusted did the education, and this is what was resulted from. Because of the endowment fund that they were able to grow, they were able to launch a midweek program for children in the community. Once the fund was known about, people could see the vision and what the funds were going to be used for, it inspired more people to come, to give. And additional bequests have brought the total over to $150,000. I think this is a good example because the congregation had a vision for what the endowment fund would do. And once they began to share it with the congregation together with education, it grew and is now accomplishing what they hoped that it would do. Another example of an endowment fund, and some of you might grin when you hear this, because first Brandon Manitoba had an endowment fund which was formerly known as their slush fund. Perhaps that it's also, some of you might know, a rainy day fund. It's just kind of sitting there. No one knows exactly what they're going to do with it, but they're like, we know it's there. It'll be helpful for a rainy day. 
Well, it wasn't growing, not doing much. So they wanted to revitalize it. They changed the name and it's now called the Partner in Ministry Fund. The income from the fund matches current gifts to expand or launch ministries. That's one way that they found that the, to have the endowment not undermine current gifts, but actually encourage more current gifts by having a matching component. During foundation month, they tell the stories of the people who made the gifts and celebrate it. It's a great way to promote the fund as well as for people to learn about it. Here's another example. St. Andrews Kingston, Ontario decided that their endowment fund would cover the maintenance and upkeep of their building, which is a large historic building. And so many congregations are finding that these large historic buildings are very expensive to maintain. So now by having an endowment fund, which supports the maintenance and upkeep of the building, they're able to tell people that their gifts through the offering plate go to support the mission and ministry of the church. And it's another way that they encourage current giving to the church. People can really see that it's going to go towards God's mission. So I think that's an exciting way. So these are just a few samples. In the book workbook that we have, there's a whole bunch more samples of congregations that have created endowment and legacy funds that are helping to support their mission and ministry. So let's say perhaps your congregation has funds. Uh, many have a collection of funds, some of which may or may not have been designated. And a key question is, are they the ones you want? What are they achieving? So a helpful exercise is to have the congregation imagine it has received a sizable undesignated bequest. Let's say, I don't know, $250,000 or $500,000, significant in, in any context, but an amount of money that would be significant in your context. And then talk about what happens to the money received. There are probably different ideas. Sometimes it depends on who left the gift. It can be tied up in debate as people try to guess what happens. So one reason that many donors make the language in their gifts too restrictive is that there are no policies in their congregation about how to channel legacy and other planned gifts. Well-designed policies can serve to promote legacy gifts. And so they help donors to see how their gifts will enhance the life and mission of the church. So a well-designed policy for planned gifts can answer those questions before they happen, and they can help with the funds that you want. So a good policy prevents the misuse of such extraordinary gifts. It provides clear guidance to ensure that your congregation is ready to receive, invest, and use legacy funds to sustain your congregation's long-term ministry, while also providing flexibility. It assures donors that gifts will be uh, used responsibly and promotes the giving of major and legacy gifts. So a good policy prevents the mis misuse of extraordinary gifts, and it provides clear guidance to ensure that your congregation is ready to receive, invest, and use legacy gifts to sustain your congregation's long-term ministry while also providing flexibility. It assures donors that gifts will be used responsibly, promotes the giving major and legacy gifts. So lucky for you, we have a workbook that is on our plan giving resources page. The website is presbyterian.ca backslash plan giving backslash resources. But you could also just search for setting up legacy funds and endowments and you'd find it. This workbook is a wonderful workbook very helpful. It breaks the policies down that you would need to establish these funds into the different sections. And it provides sample language, <coughs> which you can cut and paste and adapt for your congregation. There's real examples from real congregations. And then that each section has a checklist so that you can review it to make sure that you have included everything that's important or if you already have a policy, you can also just check to make sure that everything is there. This just gives you an idea of the table of contents so you can see how detailed everything is. We're gonna go over the sections in this webinar. The workbook is divided into the sections that are normally included in policies. Each section includes a content and rationale for the material included. 
And it's got the real life examples. The big point is, is that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. If you find something you like, feel free to incorporate it or adapt it. The context for every congregation is different. So it is important that you wrestle with and talk about and pray about the wording that you'll use for your section. So let's go ahead and review some of the sections now. Now, a well thought out policy provides guidance for how undesignated plan gifts will be channeled while still retaining the flexibility. So your policy should fit the ethos and specific needs of your congregation. And many congregations state that plan gifts will not be used for the annual operating budget. And this can help avoid providing an excuse for current members to reduce their annual gifts because we have so much money in the bank. It also assures potential donors that their life savings are being invested into the future vision of the church. Some congregations with older facilities, for instance, choose to channel a significant portion of undesignated plan gifts into their building fund. And this can help relieve some of the added pressure that buildings can place on the annual budget while honoring the legacy of past generations who built the building. The purpose of legacy giving policies and endowment funds is not to tie us up in red tape, but to set us free to share the gospel for generations to come. So one of the key questions that you need to ask for your policies is this question, to endow or not to endow? In order to answer this, we need to know the difference between an endowment fund and other funds. The endowment fund keeps the capital invested and only uses the interest so that the fund lasts in perpetuity. So the interest is used. We're going to talk a little bit more about the investments and how to know how much of an endowment fund you will use, but that's the basic principle of your endowment fund. We've been calling all other funds legacy funds. Sometimes they may be also called restricted funds. They're ones that have a specific purpose, but they can be designed so that both the capital and the interest is used. The fund may eventually be spent down. It all depends what the terms of the funds are, and the terms are multiple. It depends what serves the mission and ministry of the church. So the question that you need to ask is, do we want a large capital tied up and not used in ministry? Well, if it's going to if the interest is going to be enough to support and be significant, it can be really help enhance your ministry. Or do you want to say, we want a fund that we can use as we need it to invest in future ministry of the church? There's different options. And some congregations opt for a blended approach where they have an endowment fund and they have other funds that are used with different terms. So, or sometimes they'll have, if an undesignated gift is given, some people will decide some of it will go into an endowed fund and some of it will go into a fund where the money can be used immediately. So you can really look at and decide what will work for your congregation. Let's go to the tale of three churches. So <clears throat> here we have three different churches. So one example is St. Columba Church in Parksville, BC, that decided that no portion of undesignated plan gifts will be endowed. They adopted the policy of tithing all the undesignated plan gifts they receive. So one-tenth is used for outreach with the remaining 90% retained for special projects beyond the operating budget approved by the congregation. Each year, the congregation has the happy task of figuring out how to give a percentage of their wealth away on special projects and mission beyond their walls. Another congregation whose general endowment fund has been sufficient to meet their ongoing maintenance, maintenance costs adopted the policy of channeling all undesignated bequests and other planned gifts into a newly organized growth fund. Money in this fund is not endowed but can be used in its entirety for new ministry initiatives, both within and beyond the congregation. The minister noted that knowing the money was to be used to grow the congregation's ministry and outreach brought a new spirit of possibility thinking in the congregation, providing the resources to turn dreams into reality. We became less focused on our own survival and more open to where God's spirit was leading us, he says, knowing that God had already provided the resources we needed to move forward. Finally, we have an example, Church 3. Like St. Andrew's Kingston, 
It has an endowment fund which takes the pressure off the budget for the maintenance of an old historic building and uses the donors, I'm uh, sorry, and assuring donors that offerings go to mission and ministry. Now, some congregations may have all three funds, and people may choose to leave gifts for the funds depending on their purpose and function. Your plan giving policy is what to do with undesignated bequests or gifts made to the church. How does the church want to handle them? Smaller congregations may want to have one main fund, and that is the fund you are actively promoting because you want gifts to go there and for it to grow. You can use the workbook to create the policies for any of the types of funds. We will focus on the policy for your undesignated plan gifts. So let's talk about some definitions. In all these instances, it's important to clearly define what your terms and phrases mean. So the workbook begins with a section on definitions. Now, some congregations have approved the establishment of an endowment fund, uh, only to discover that some in the congregation are shocked when a bequest is received and that the policy that they have just adopted only allows for the earned income, not a portion of the principal itself, to be used for the needed project. So when you talk about using the annual income for ministry and or capital projects, do you mean only the interest earned from interest bearing bonds or GICs, the interest plus dividend earnings from stocks or the overall return of your investment portfolio, you know, interest, dividends and capital gains? Even familiar terms such as mission can be interpreted different ways. Does mission refer to only outreach beyond the congregation? Or does it include uh, all ministries and programs in service to, of your congregation's mission and uh, a variety of ways resulting in potential confusion and conflict down the road? Uh, the greater the clarity uh, you, you provide, the better. So there are sample definitions provided in the workbook and you can use these to begin to create your policy and use the definitions that are important to you. So for example, begin at the very beginning by stating what an endowment is, then define what the annual income is and define what you mean by mission. So just have a section in your policy that strictly deals with definitions. Okay, so next section, a preamble. A preamble gives the background rationale and biblical and theological basis for your fund and can help the members and supporters of your congregation understand the difference between the legacy fund, which is there for the long-term ministry of the church, and the money offered Sunday after Sunday, which is used for the annual operating budget. The preamble should clearly indicate that the fund has been established to serve the long-term mission objectives of your congregation and as an aid in growing generous and faithful stewards. By including the theological and biblical underpinnings for the fund, the preamble helps the congregation understand that the legacy giving program is rooted in fundamental Christian stewardship principles. It includes information that will be used in ongoing teaching and preaching about the ministry of legacy giving in your congregation. You wanna go? The next section, the next section is, looks at the purpose and the objectives of the fund. So there's some ideas in there to really help you figure out what do we want this fund to achieve? And you're basically explaining why you've designed the fund the way that you've designed it and why people will wanna give it, give to it. So be sure that the your purpose and your objectives are succinct and as clear as possible. The In the workbook, you'll find Ah, this information will be included in the promotion of the fund. So probably the wording that you used here could be lifted out and put in brochures, newsletters, on your website, in announcements for worship. So it's important that it be engaging and succinct to avoid confusion and misunderstandings and misuse of the fund in the future. Now note, again, if your fund is a permanent endowment, or if it has a general or more focused purpose, if the bequests and undesignated plan gifts contributed to the church are gonna be placed into this fund, include that here in this section. The information included in this section not only guides the session and congregation in how to receive, invest, and use such gifts, 
It will also serve as a guide for prospective donors considering making a plan gift to the church. Like as we said, there are actual samples in the workbook. And we're only showing you this to show you that sample wording is provided for legacy and endowment funds as the purposes are different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this one looks at the legacy fund purpose and objectives. And you can see it's pretty succinct um, that it's set up to sustain and enhance the long-term mission of the church beyond what would normally be possible through its annual operating budget. Um, it says that the fund will be invested and utilized um, as follows. So you'd go and you would outline all of that. Now this one is just a legacy fund. This one isn't actually an endowment fund. So the next one is your endowment fund. So this is would really elaborate and say that this is explaining the more permanent nature of the fund and that it will help the church continue its ministry far um, beyond the donor's lifetime. It'll talk about the annual income, which can be used and what it can be used to do. So when you look in the workbook, just be sure to, to see what will suit the fund you wanna create. If you wanna create an endowment fund, that's wonderful. Use the endowment language. And if you're looking to do a legacy fund, one that's not permanently endowed, then use some of the language from the legacy funds. So the structure and composition of legacy funds can differ significantly from congregation to congregation, depending on the purpose of your legacy giving program and the kind of funds your congregation already has in place. Now, under fund structure and composition is where you, you explain how the structure fits the fund. And it's crucial to differentiate the legacy fund from the operating budget account, both for investment and ministry purposes, and also for communication purposes. People need to understand that the money they give to the church through the offering plate is intended to be spent in the year their gifts are made, whereas the money contributed through bequests and other legacy gifts will be invested in a separate fund for the long-term life and ministry of the church. To help people relate, the general operating account of the church can be described as being like a checking account for current expenses whereas the legacy funds are kind of like an RRSP or RRIF, a RIF for long-term financial support and security. People are usually able to understand that distinction. Now, here's a couple of examples of uh, fund structures. In the fund structure, oh, wait a minute. Uh, in the fund structure, congregations establish broad guidelines or percentages for how legacy funds will be apportioned and used. And donors can leave an undesignated gift knowing that it will be apportioned to the unidentified categories. So here's the examples. Here's example one. You might have three structures within your fund. Different percentages may be assigned to each. Someone may choose to designate their gift for one or more of the broad purposes identified in your fund. But this helps prevent donors from making gifts that are overly restrictive if, over time, one category becomes fully funded, the session and congregation has the option of changing the percentages or altering the categories for further gifts. Now, it is important to decide whether any undesignated legacy gift given to the church will be fully endowed or whether some or all of the principal will be available as needed. So many congregations opt to allocate a percentage, let's say 50% of any undesignated plan gift into their general endowment, while the remainder is apportioned to broad categories in which both the principal and the annual income are available as needed. Now, just note that some congregations already have a number of special funds and trust funds in place. Perhaps yours does. So you need to think about how your legacy fund is going to relate to those funds. In some instances, some of the funds may become sub funds or sub accounts in some of the larger categories that you use to help establish your legacy fund. You kind of have to go back to that question we asked at the very beginning. If somebody was to leave a gift of $250,000 undesignated to your congregation, how would you like it to be used. What you're doing here is creating your fund structure. So if we were to use this example and say that this was the fund, you'd say, okay, that $250,000, um, 
125,000 of it is going to go into the general endowment. And there, the capital will be preserved and the income will be used to fund mission and ministry. Then you'd say 10% of it could go immediately to enhance the facilities of the church and be available for your building committee to decide this year and next year what they want to do with it. So 10% of $250,000, that's $25,000. Then you could say 30% would go to ministry programs within the church. So that $75,000 is immediate, available immediately for the congregation to use. And then you could say 10% or $25,000 would be available for outreach beyond the congregation. You might even have a process where committees or groups could apply for those gifts. But it's the gifts, the mission and ministry out in the community, doing something really outside. Now, if you are working this through, you might go, hmm, wow, $75,000 for ministry programs within the congregation, that would overwhelm our congregation. Maybe these percentages don't quite work out. And so you can play with them and you might decide, actually, we want the general endowment to be 60% or 70% of the gift. But that's where using some tangible numbers and sort of thinking it through can help you build this structure. What's important is that you want to have the capacity to use the funds in a way that will enhance your church's ministry into the future. And that's why the workbook is so useful because you, you're given language that you can use. For instance, here's an example um, of some of the cut and paste options you might want to consider. And you know, you try to be as broad as possible when, when you're writing these things. A useful case study is St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Aurelia, Ontario. They had a history of receiving many bequests, some which were for funds designated for specific purposes, but there was a lack of clarity. However, whether some or all of the trusts were to be treated as endowments, whether the principal and income could be used. But as a result of the leadership, the church developed clear guidelines and established a clearer fund structure. So there was no confusion. And when the gifts came in, people knew exactly what they were supposed to do. Okay, so how are we going to administrate the fund? The day-to-day -day management is normally placed in the hands of a committee appointed and or elected for that role. So the role of the committee is to watch over the funds and manage disbursements. Many congregations often assume that such funds should be placed in the hands of the congregation trustees, but PCC policy does not so specify and it's not helpful if the Office of Congregational Trustee is an honorary role in which the office holders are re-elected year after year. So care should be taken that the committee does not usurp the proper authority of the session or congregation. The number of people serving on the committee can vary depending on the size of the congregation and the fund. Usually five to seven members are sufficient. There should be some system of rotation on the committee so that the membership does not become entrenched or static. While it is beneficial for members of the committee to have some financial expertise, it is even more essential that the members are well-respected and trusted members of the congregation with an understanding of and heart for the church's mission and ministry. In many congregations, the church treasurer also serves as treasurer of the funds. Other congregations choose to appoint someone other than the church treasurer to serve as the fund treasurer so that the legacy gifts are clearly separated from the funds in the operating budget. This workbook contains a sample fund committee, uh, sorry, that you can adapt for your congregation. So let's just move on. All right. So. Okay, so now it's time to name your fund. We've been talking about endowment fund or legacy fund, but it doesn't really inspire. I think even something like a mortar fund or a mission fund or a ministry fund, people are like, Okay, think how creative can you be? Come up with a creative name that will inspire people to give. And we'll just give you a few pointers on this. First of all, only use the word endowment if it is an actual endowment fund, if you are preserving the capital and only spending the income. We often are asked, and a lot of congregations have, they call it the memorial or the heritage fund. But something to think about, memorial or heritage kind of implies that the fund is about the past, when really we're talking about is the future of the church. So we wanna be sure that we're not limiting the scope of the fund. 
Um, sometimes people put bequest, the bequest fund, but bequest implies that only bequests can be given to the fund and it's not available for legacy gifts from the living. So a question you need to ask yourself is, do you only want people to give to the fund after they die? Well, bequests are the most familiar and most common way that people will contribute to your legacy or endowment fund. They're by far the only way. And it's really interesting that there's a trend right now that more and more Canadians are giving major gifts from their assets while they're living rather than waiting until after they pass away because they want to see the impact of the, what their gift will have as well as take full advantage of tax benefits. So let's encourage people to make a living legacy, to give to these funds while they're still alive. But if they're not able to, to think of them when they don't need their assets anymore. So here's kind of some fun sample fund names. These are names that real congregations have chosen and come up with. We have the Seeds of Hope Fund, or the Advancing the, the Vision Fund, the Hope in Action Fund. I like this one, the Living Waters Enduring Gifts Fund, helped reflect the fact that the congregation believed that gener generosity flows from the hearts of donors. Contributing to this fund has its source in the same life-giving spirit Jesus was offering when he said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. So if you can have some scripture that you would include in your preamble that explains the name of the fund, go for it. Have fun with it. Now, while it is likely that the vast majority of legacy gifts given to your congregation will be gratefully accepted, it's important to recognize that there may be exceptions. Some gifts may come with liabilities that could jeopardize the financial security or the reputation of your congregation. For instance, a gift of real estate with environmental hazards. Also, an overly restrictive gift could force your congregation to move in a direction that does not serve its mission. So it's important to remember that if you accept a gift with certain restrictions, you are legally and ethically bound to comply with them. You'll notice here there's a, an image of a French horn, a $2,500 legacy gift designated for the purchase of a French horn for the church's brass band. Well, that doesn't work if the church doesn't have a brass band or anyone who knows how to play French horn. So it's a good example of how you can get a gift that doesn't quite fit with your church. So Declining gifts often carry pastoral concerns and should be handled carefully, stating in writing the reasons for declining the gift, and if possible, having members of the fund committee or session speak in person with the donor or donor's representatives. In many cases, a discussion with the donor to glean his or her intentions can result in finding an appropriate way to structure the gift that will ensure flexibility and satisfy both the donor and the congregation's future ministry. So the workbook includes um, sample gift acceptance and decline ideas. Um, you should note that your acceptance policy may include how you will deal with gifts that are received in the forms of real or personal property, something other than cash. For example, real estate, artwork, gifts of securities, your policy might state that they will be converted to cash at their market value as quickly as possible. However, there may be occasions when the fund committee will decide that it is helpful for the church to retain a gift of property in the form in which it's received. For example, if somebody gives the piece of property right next to your church, which you'd like to turn into a parking lot for the church, you may decide that you don't want to sell that piece of property, but keep it for the use of the church. Or if somebody was giving some blue chip stocks and you decided you wanted to keep the stocks, you could decide to do that. So your policy though should state that such decisions could be made if they are submitted as recommendations to the session for final approval before the action is taken. So it's good to sort of say, yes, we will convert things to cash immediately. Then everyone knows that's what's expected. But when there's an exception, you decide you want to keep it, take it to the session for approval. All right. So normally 
It is the responsibility of the fund committee to promote the fund, but this responsibility could also be given to another, such as the committee responsible for the overall financial stewardship of the congregation or session. The key question is, who will do the best job? Who, who can speak passionately about it? Who is well respected? So the ongoing promotion of the fund is the area where most congregations kind of fall down. And it's one reason why legacy funds stagnate and don't grow. Now you can adopt a passive approach, announcing that you are ready to receive legacy gifts and delineating how such gifts will be used. Reports in the annual report or you, a more active approach you could take through educational events and an annual legacy Sunday worship service, approaching those with whom you have identified as good candidates to leave a legacy gift to the church. You know, if you, it really is something you can get creative about. It's probably best really if you do both. I mean, I have congregations who ask me sometimes or say, well, we have an endowment fund, but nobody ever gives to it. And I have to ask, well, have you ever talked about it? Have you ever celebrated the gifts that were given to it? Have you ever encouraged people to remember the endowment fund in their will? Have you shared with them the wonderful things that the endowment fund or the legacy fund is able to do? So education, promotion, donor recognition, they're all part of people being excited about seeing what God can do through these funds. So here again, we have a sample plan for education, promotion, and donor recognition. So you incorporate stewardship into sermons all year. You may do a specific Legacy Sunday on November 15th, which is coming up, but don't, uh, won't, it won't feel out of place from the rest of your sermons. Make congregation, uh, your congregation aware of what is happening by sharing stories of the ministry supported. Uh, include a report in the annual report, including a financial report, and it could include names of those who have made legacy gifts in the past year, unless they requested anonymity. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Some people will say, well, what's special about November 15th? November 15th has been assigned National Philanthropy Day. So it's a day in the secular world that you may see talk about giving and making philanthropic gifts. So we've said that Legacy Sunday is the first Sunday after November 15th. Now, some of you might think, oh, that's my upcoming Sunday, and I have no plan for a Legacy Sunday. No worries. You can do it at any time that works for your congregation. And you can think about, well, I don't know what I'd say for a Legacy Sunday. If you go to our resources online, you'll find a full worship service this year developed by the Reverend Joan Masterton, providing everything that you need for the Legacy Sunday, including your prayers, your call to worship, your children's story, your sermon. So it can even be done by someone who's not the minister. And there are plenty of examples in the workbook. Okay, so let's talk about the relationship to other funds in the church. Now, many congregations already have a number of trusts and other special funds in place, and it is important to understand the relationship between the endowment, legacy fund, and other funds in the church. So many congregations with a long history of receiving legacy gifts have never developed a comprehensive plan or policies for receiving, investing, and using these gifts. So as a result, monies may be allocated into various areas that serve neither the current nor the long-term ministry priorities of the congregation. So it's not helpful if you're a small rural congregation, you receive bequests and memorial gifts designated for its cemetery that far exceeded the cemetery's current and future needs, but lacked the funds to meet the ongoing costs of supporting the congregation's overall ministry. So your policy to handle legacy gifts is the perfect opportunity to provide an overview of all your congregation's funds, showing how they all fit together in support of your congregation's current and future ministry objectives. Your policy should clearly state how your endowment or legacy fund is related to these other funds in your congregations. Here, we've got a visual image for you. So for example, you could outline the differences between the annual operating budget, legacy fund, and memorial and honor fund, and explain that the legacy funds support the long-term life and mission of the congregation, whereas the annual operating budget funds current expenses and a more memorial and honor fund for whatever. Smaller memorial gifts. 
There we go. So the two funds are kept entirely separate, except for money transferred from the legacy fund or legacy reserve fund to pay for projects and ministries approved by the session and congregation. Your memorial or honor fund might be established to receive smaller tribute gifts in memory or in honor of someone or to celebrate a special occasion. Now we've had some people who want to just have their legacy fund and memorial and honor fund be one. It probably works if you're a small congregation. If you're a larger congregation, your memorial and honor fund is really for smaller gifts under a thousand dollars. And your legacy fund is really for encouraging the larger gifts, $10,000, $50,000 a year, where they're given in memorial or honor, but it's a larger gift. So it's really, though, about what serves your congregation and how many funds you can handle or have. Now, here's something for you to think about. You hear about this more with hospitals or universities. And congregations can think about whether or not they want to have named funds. And named funds can either be in the name of a person, so you could think about your a parent or a grandparent and say, we want to have the um, Karen Plater fund. Or you can think a name in terms of giving it a name, such as a blessings fund. So you can provide an option to have a named fund, or if a person gives a gift long or large enough that they might want to name the fund. If you're going to do that, you want to ask yourself, well, what income would be needed to make the administration of a named fund worthwhile? Because every fund requires administration. It quite requires time and effort into managing the fund as well as deciding how it would be used. So for example, you might decide, well, $10,000 a year, if a fund was gonna provide $10,000 a year, that would be significant. We could have a named fund. So if you decide we want to start with $10,000 a year, you could decide, well, we could either have a, if somebody was to make a gift of say $50,000 and we'd spend it over five, five years. So then in that case, it's not an endowment fund. It's a fund where it's spent over time and you could give that fund a name. Alternatively, if it was going to be endowed fund, you could say, well, the interest from gifts of a $200,000 given in memory or in honor of someone, could be a named fund and it would provide or could provide $10,000 a year if it was getting 5% interest, for example. So you can just think about that. It's not very popular in congregations, um, but it's, it is an option for people who are thinking, I want to, to name it for a while. And you can think, does it enhance the ministry of our church? Um, but one thing is encourage prospective donors to contact the fund committee about their intention to talk to them about the parameters of such of the fund. In that case, you'd probably want to establish a gift agreement. And we in the plan giving and stewardship department have sometimes helped congregations work on gift agreements. And the gift agreement would outline exactly how the gift was going to be used, what the name of the fund would be, and the terms, very much like a year endowment fund. In all cases, very important to remember to include a variation clause. This is a clause which authorized the session to vary the purpose of the fund in the spirit of the gift if the original terms become obsolete. This is especially important if a fund is established now that might not come to fruition until 20 years when somebody passes away. Circumstances may change in 20 years, particularly in our rapidly changing world. Hi, so let's uh, talk again about a congregation exercise. You go back to the beginning and you reimagine your undesignated bequest and follow it through your policy. So some congregations have adopted policies and then discovered that people were operating on different assumptions and understandings. And these came out when they actually discussed how they thought a specific gift would be handled. Remember, the purpose of the policy is to prevent potential areas of confusion and conflict, not add to it. So clar clarify these procedures beforehand. Simple flowcharts to demonstrate the decision-making process and lines of authority in handling planned gifts can help. Right. So let's talk about your spending policy. How are the gifts going to be spent? Well, what's your fund going to achieve? 
if your endowment fund is going to provide a dependable source of annual revenue. It can help support the annual budget if that's the intention of the fund. But mostly you're looking at ways that the funds can, sus can sustain and grow the church's mission for the future. It's very important that you have annual guidelines for spending. So one thing, particularly if it's an endowment fund, you need to say, how are we gonna fund the, spend the income? Are we going to spend, for example, the annual yield, which is your dividends plus your interest? Or are we gonna look at the total value of the fund? So sort of your yield plus a capital appreciation means that you allow the fund to grow each year a little bit to, in order to uh, counteract inflation or the percentage and total value. So sometimes people will figure out that we're going to do um, five to 6% of the three to five year rolling average of the fund and that that's how much is gonna be spent. If you're gonna do that, you reevaluate that every three to five years or so to see are we, is the fund eating into the capital? Is it beginning to disappear? Or is it maintaining its uh, value? And in fact, even you might want it to grow in order for inflation. There's lots of details. It's a bit complicated, but there's lots of details in the workbook when you really wanna get into this. So figuring out how is the money spent, the first part was figuring out how much of it was going to be fun funded. But now you wanna say, and what's it going to accomplish? What's it gonna do? So you need to figure out, are you gonna put a certain percentage into a predetermined area? And that comes back to our fund structure, if it's going to mortar, ministry or mission. And uh, this will tell you and be very specific, both guiding and assuring the donors for how the funds will be used. The other thing is it could be, you could say, well, each year the congregation is gonna consider how the fund is spent. So that's like the growth fund that we talked about where each year they have a certain amount and then they decide what project will this help enhance right now. And really do wrestle with that question of whether any of the funds will be for the operating budget. The best practice is that it really is investing in the future ministry of the church. But sometimes as we saw with St. Andrews Kingston, helping to cover the expense of looking after an older historic building can free up people's current gifts to invest in the future mission and ministry of the church, which they can get very excited about. So design your fund, depending on what you want it to accomplish. Okay, we can speak just briefly about the disbursement quota. It's not a big thing to worry about. Uh, the Canada Revenue Agency recognizes that while many charities have endowments and other investments, such funds are not to be treated as simple savings accounts uh, that accumulate cash. They're there to serve the long-term ministry objectives of the charity. So um, it's, I think it's important to remember that, uh, however, that it's it's a merely 3.5% average value over 24 month period. So, um, you know, there's a lot of information in the workbook about this, but um, I, you can also look it up on the CRA website. It's not a major concern, so we're not gonna dwell on it today. Yeah, because congregations are spending most of the gifts that they receive on caring for their building, paying their minister. So really your 3.5% average is just, it's so small compared to those other gifts. Okay, let's talk about the investment policy. So it's important to provide guidelines in your policy regarding how the money in your legacy fund will be invested. Since your fund is intended for the long-term support of your congregation, it's important that you have both a growth, either you know, sort of blue chip equities, an income component, you know, something like GICs. So your policy needs to indicate your risk tolerance. Now this can work both for legacy funds and endowment funds. You definitely want an investment policy when you've gotten your endowment fund because your endowment fund is intended to exist in perpetuity. But even a legacy fund, that you're wanting to spend over five to 10 years is going to be invested so that it'll grow and provide more resources during those five to 10 years. So really important to look at that. Most congregations don't have a professional money manager who handle their investments, but if you were to have one, you need to provide them with guidelines to follow. And you need to ask about what's important. What are you looking for? 
maybe look at benchmarks that you want to have established or you want to compare so that you can say, is our fund doing okay compared to the other funds about this, um, this structure that we have? You can look at whether or not you want to be invested in specific investments or through indexed funds. So those are all guidelines that you can provide for your professional money manager. You also may want to talk about what's the risk tolerance that you have when you're investing in securities, if you're investing in securities and not the annual income. And you may even want to talk about socially responsible or ethical investments. So those are all something to talk about. Now, a number of congregations have invested in the PCCs, consolidated portfolio. If a congregation is interested in that, they have to have a minimum of investment of $150,000. And feel free to contact us and we can share with you how that can do. But that is a fund that at the PCC that's been earning decent returns. Okay, so folks are gonna to want to apply for funding. And if committees or organizations within the church can apply for funds, it's helpful to have clear procedures in place regarding how applications will be handled. You may need a, a method of reporting and or evaluating the outcomes and or benefits of the funded projects. Some congregations specify that only groups or committees within the church can apply for funds. So if individuals apply, those applications must be channeled through an established group in the church. This um, example comes from our Stewards by Design in 2018. Chippewa Presbyterian Church just shared an example that I thought was good to articulate their spending policy formula. So they decided that they do 4.75% of their five-year rolling average of, year, of the year-end assets. So they take how much do they have in the fund at the year-end, and they take 4.5% of that, and that's what they have um, available. So they, while well, they take the, how much was in the, huh, what's the average of the five years at the year end? So they found that having this formula el eliminated conflicts over whether they were spending and what, and preserving the underlying assets. So finding that balance, but they also reassess that amount every few years to make sure they look at the, what the fund has been earning and make sure that it's not dipping into the capital too much. Now Chippewa, it's interesting, they decided that their endowment would be spent in these different ways. So the 37% part of the pie is amount that the board of managers had access to and could decide how they could spend. They provided 9% in RTF grants, which were grants that people could apply to for the community, I believe. They had a section that could go towards Presbyterian sharing and that 27% and 27% for other mission and ministry. So the congregation has fun in deciding about where the funds will go and seeing what God will do with them. Their reality, their practical experience was that the fund itself was providing the equivalent of around 10 to 12% of their total church spending. They found that it allowed them to send half of their Presbyterian sharing in the first quarter of the year. And they also have used it since 2010 to pay for the principal on their mortgage that they used in order to expand the church. So they got a mortgage to do a church expansion and now their fund is helping them to pay that as well. So it's definitely investing in the future mission of the church by paying that mortgage. Now there's gonna come a time when you're gonna to need to make changes and amendments. So it's important for everyone in the congregation to understand that policies for handling planned gifts are subject to adjustments as the needs and circumstances of the congregation change. Endowment policies are living documents that are meant to serve the mission of your congregation. So your policy should be reviewed annually or every three years or more frequently as needs arise to ensure that the policies and procedures your congregation has put in place are still serving your current and long-term ministry objectives and within CRA guidelines. So most congregations adopt a process whereby the endowment fund committee recommends modifications to session for review and approval with session in turn recommending any changes or amendments to the congregation for final approval, usually at the annual meeting. So the percentage required in a congregational vote can vary from a simple majority to 66% or 75% of those present at a, a duly called meeting. 
We're almost there. We're on slide 44 or 47. It's really important to also talk about what happens if the congregation amalgamates or dissolves. Unfortunately, this is a question that we're often asked, particularly if people are planning to make a legacy gift 10 or 20 years into the future. So you want to be sure that your policy has a plan for what happens if the congregation amalgamates or dissolves. Most often, um, the funds will follow the am amalgamated congregation. And often, if it dissolves, it'll go to the Presbyterian Church in Canada. But ensure that there are the legal requirements are met and that the appropriate practices are followed. Okay, so more and more congregations are establishing legacy funds as an integral way to help their members grow as generous and faithful Christian stewards. And endowment funds are not just one way to raise more money for the church. They are a way to channel the generosity of God's people into the service of Christ's mission in the world. And people can pass on a legacy of faith and hope to future congregations. So I'd just like to note, it is recommended that the policies be reviewed by appropriate legal and tax specialists to ensure that they're in keeping with the federal and provincial laws and regulations where you are. So may God guide you and your congregation as together you seek to grow in this vital area of ministry to the end that God's abundant grace may abound in the church and the world, both now and for generations to come. I think this has been a bit of a whirlwind presentation. We really tried to pack it in and it's our first webinar we've had that's taken the full hour. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in and we're happy to answer them for you now. Well, I think everybody's just overwhelmed. <laughs> We are also happy, we'll stay on for a few more minutes, but we're happy to take any questions that you have when you're creating your endowment um, and legacy funds in the future. We're happy to look at sample ones. We're happy to see them once they get approved. We're gonna review and expand and uh, continue to develop the workbook that we have. It really is a living document. So as we get more examples, we're happy to include you. If you've got a story of what really works well in your congregation, Feel free to share it with that. Oh yeah, us. we'd love to hear it. We'd love to share it. We'll we'll get it into the newspaper. We'll we'll spread the message. We really want to see what God is doing with the gifts that have been given. We're getting a few thank yous coming in in the chat. Thank you very much. You're right. Welcome. Yeah. Great. Well, good luck, and let us know what happens and what you do. And remember to download the workbook from uh, Plan Giving Resources. Oh. A computer, somebody wants to know what's the link to the website where all of this is. Sure, we can go back to that. You want me to slide backwards? Yeah. Okay. There you go. I'll get the... Can you do that? Wait, 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 wait. Just a sec, just a sec, just a sec. Oh, see all slide? Oh, yeah. well, there they are. <laughs> oh, there it is. Download the workbook. Okay. Number 45. There we are. There's, oh, that's the workbook, but actually where the webinar is at presbyterian.ca. Oh yeah, that's at the very beginning. Yeah. That's it. There we go. You can find this webinar if you wanna watch it again. Um, just type in webinars or previous webinars on the Presbyterian website and you'll find it, but there's the link for you there. Hey, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we're really glad you're able to, to join in and do call us anytime. Oh, there we are. <laughs> thanks, James. <laughs> thanks, bye.